are now live. Okay, thank you. So Senate Governor Operations, June 2nd. And um, I see we have some guests with us. So just in case people don't remember who we are, um, we'll introduce ourselves, which we normally do when we're in the room in a um, committee meeting. So I'm Jeanette White from Wyndham County. I'm Anthony Polina from Washington County. Brian Collimore from Rutland County. Allison Clarkson, Windsor County District. And I don't know if we have Senator Brady. He says he's still, he says he's still connecting. Okay, well, we will have Senator Bray from Addison County. So, um, so welcome. I see we have Catherine Long with us. We have June Heston. Hi, June. And um, we got your news. I got your news. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. I, I'll be sending out my announcement today. Good. Congratulations. And Thank you. And we have um, Kat, who, let's see, I, oh, we have Adjutant General Knight, Catherine Becker Van Hayes. Oh, and there's Senator Bray. Uh, did I miss anybody here? Who's 802-380? Do we know who that is, Gail? There's somebody Possibly on here. Possibly Bob Burke. Yep, that's me. Oh, eight two eight three three eight zero. Thank you. No video. Right, so good. Thank. Okay. Thank you. So what we're doing is, um, before we left the state house in March, um, we had thought that we would have an update on our burn pit legislation. I was um uh, a major for me anyway, I felt it was a major piece of legislation that we passed and um, wanted to just hear where we were, get an update. Has it made a difference? Is there anything new? Is there anything, <coughs> excuse me, else we need to do? Um, committee, do you want to throw out any other ideas about what we might want to hear? And then we'll just jump right into it. No? No, I'm, I'm, I'm most curious about whether people are signing up, taking advantage right. of whether, How know. many right. people have, yeah. Yeah, and, and I, yeah. I guess I'd, I'd like to ask what has led to the lawsuit that we now have from uh, the, the, in, in the, the White River Junction area. Mm -hmm. so, All right. It. So um, let's... Uh, here first, I guess from, um, I'm going to uh, jump here and hear first from June. I think June, you were one of our major um, witnesses when we passed this before. And I'd just like to hear your take on this before we get into real specifics or if you have specifics too, that would be great. Well, I, <laughs> I, I have had um, a conversation with, um, the adjutant general or the deputy adjutant general in probably uh, six to eight weeks, but they had been doing a lot of work with getting kiosks up and running so that mm -hmm. at any function they were hosting for guard members, they had the opportunity right there to register on the burn pit registry because there is an issue I think with, and I think um, General, I can speak to this better than I can, but there is an issue when trying to get on a government computer um, and, and complete that burn pit registry. Um, and they have done some work in getting uh, postings to all of the town clerk's offices, I believe, to posting, you know, for veterans to, to consider getting on the burn pit registry. Uh, I have no idea what the health department has done for that piece of the law. So that I would be interested in, in hearing more. Okay, and have you, I know that when we first did this, one of the things that you talked about was having heard from people around the country. Yes. Has, has, is that still true that people are? Um, yes. I am actually participating in, a, in an organization called 
team, which is working on federal legislation. Um, they currently have a draft for that's focused on the VA, um, and that has been um, submitted for review. It's not. It's. It, it isn't in yet, but I we have had a couple of meetings in DC before COVID hit. Um, with uh, uh, Senator Jill Brand's team has been working on legislation as well. The, the initial meeting was to try to get everybody to work together, but I think there's still three, at least three or four different pieces of legislation being proposed. And our goal was to try to have it be one. Um, I'm not in love with the current proposal, but it is working on um, expanding healthcare and benefits for veterans. Um, establishing research and review um, regarding exposure and then improving the resources to the VA regarding toxic exposure. Um, and now they're also writing a bill that will be DOD focused. Um, so there, there are, I would say 25 or so veterans organizations and nonprofits uh, coming together to write this legislation. And John good. Stewart has joined the fight. Oh, good. He was pretty effective. He was. This, yeah, great. <clears throat> and so, so let's just um, kind of get some reports here and committee feel free to ask questions or um, we'll just go through and, and then just have a general discussion. Is that okay? Sure. We'll do it that way. Okay, so Adjutant General, do you want to, um, General Knight, do you want to uh, tell us what's been going on from your perspective? Absolutely, ma'am, happy to do that. I hope everybody's doing well. Mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. all, th all things considered. <laughs> so uh, from the outset, we've been uh, pretty aggressive in, in getting the word out through multiple venues. And, and on multiple occasions. So uh, as, as June had mentioned, you know, we work with town clerks, uh, the VA, um, I've done a couple of uh, postings on social media. That's the Vermont National Guard Facebook page, uh, the Adjutant General Facebook page, uh, even to posting uh, the CNN interview with uh, Wes Black and, and talking mm -hmm. about his experience. Um, I've sent all Vermont emails, which goes to our full-time force and ideally percolates down to our drilling members in Air and Army National Guard. I put it on our SharePoint, and it's, that's something that uh, most of the Army National Guard full-time staff can see. We've done directed mailings to retirees who are deployed to areas with um, <coughs> open air burn pits and to those that separated from the service. And then uh, as, as mentioned uh, by June, uh, Ken Gregg set up uh, work with our state counterparts and set up uh, kiosks so we do an annual soldier readiness processing, and that's for administrative and medical readiness. And we put these uh, drops that are not on the government system. Uh, what we found is there are a number of firewalls, and it just presents some challenges in working through the DOD system to actually log in and register. So trying to make it easy for everybody to do that. Um, my concern and a little bit of frustration is the further we get away from deployments, the more difficult it becomes to reach out to folks and, and encourage them to uh, log in. I, I don't understand the rationale. Uh, we're making it you know, abundantly clear why it's important for them to do it. Uh, but I can give you some numbers. So for instance, June of 2014 through the fourth quarter of 2019, uh, Vermont had 544 participants in the Airborne Hazards and Open Burn Pit Registry. Uh, and then from uh, June, now through the uh, second quarter of 20, we're up to 637. So that's good, it, it's a positive trend, but I know for a fact we've had thousands of our members deployed over the past 15 years. Um, that number still doesn't approach uh, what we should be seeing in, in, in our efforts to get folks enrolled. And I did see a, a news article uh, on, on the lawsuit against the VA from West Black uh, and to boil it down, uh, it was either a, a misdiagnosis or a failure to properly diagnose uh, what was going on with him. But right. that's what I've got for now, ma'am. So <clears throat> I do find it concerning that, uh, Anthony. Uh, could somebody just tell me, I feel kind of out of this. I don't know much about this lawsuit. I'm just curious, could I get a little more of a sketch of what the lawsuit's about? 
yeah, yeah. could you Greg, general... do you want to do it? Yeah. Sure. So, so West Black deployed twice. He deployed once with us to Iraq in 2005, 2006, and then later with our uh, brigade to Afghanistan in 2010. Uh, in both instances, he was exposed at some level to open air burn pits. Um, he'd had some intestinal, lower intestinal issues, some bowel issues, and they were treating him for irritable bowel syndrome. Um, but they never did a colonoscopy, and that's really kind of the root cause here. Had they done a colonoscopy, as I understand it, they may have identified the problem much sooner. Uh, unfortunately, now it's metastasized, and I think at uh, age 34, he's uh, basically on a, on a lim limited time with us. He's, is to term his, uh, to use his term, he, he's a dead man walking um, at age 34. So that's that's kind of the crux of it. It was basically a misdiagnosis. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Um, Chris has the same I, note. Yeah, I do find it very concerning that um, we have even that few, I mean, even though it's a improving that we have that few who have registered. Um, Bob, do you want to um, weigh in here? Bob Burke? Sure. <clears throat> yep, sure. Um, so again, you know, same thing as the Adjutant General had said, you know, we've put it out on our website, social media, any outreach um, that we have been doing over the past year, obviously nothing in the past three months, um, but we've been talking it up and encouraging people to participate, um, not just for the sake of participating, but to gather that information so that you know decisions can be made on mm -hmm. causation and things such as that. So we continue to spread the word. Um, again, you know, as June had said, I don't know of anything that the health department has done in terms of pushing out to civilian providers to you know ask that question. So I I I'm also interested um, if. Uh, you know, what or if anything has been done from, from that angle. <clears throat> and I, um, I am hoping that we um, invited the um, health department since they're on the list of, and also the Vermont Medical Society. Um, but I don't see anybody here from either of those, um, from the department or from the, VMS. Um, Senator, but, so, I, yes. Um, the we did not uh, invite the health department, but I did get a note from Jessa Barnard, and I will post that on our website. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, because the Vermont Medical Society was um, hopefully going to be very active here in sending out. The information. I'm, I my that's my my apologies for not making sure that the Department of Health was was notified. Um, that's that doing this um, virtually is sometimes a challenge because you don't have the access to the lists of who the usual suspects are. So um, so uh, Madam Chair. Yes. Can I ask a question now? You certainly can. Okay, I'd like to, uh, the Adjutant General uh, said, uh, was giving us a head count on registrants. And I think you, uh, he'd said we got up to about 640, but he was a little disappointed. So um, Adjutant General Knight, can you, what would, if you had to just ballpark a figure of how many people um, Vermont had exposed I don't know, it's 640 compared to what universe, you know? Do you have a guess? Well, sir, I, I can tell you, um, in, in fi probably about 15 years worth of deployments now, it would number easily in the thousands. Um, I'd have to work a little bit and do some digging to give you an exact number, but uh, certainly 2,000 or more. Four years ago, there's been 2,500 Vermonters. Through four years ago, there had been 2,500 Vermonters. 
So through four years ago, I just talked with, with Ken, um, through four years ago, uh, 2,500 had been deployed and that, that's Air and Army. Okay, great. And um, I guess just to sort of finish off the path, do you know how many folks have been deployed where there was a burn pit since four years ago? Or ballpark? I would, I would have to say uh, nearly all of them. And, and I don't know the number of people deployed, sorry. Like, how many have gone? Oh, well, in the, in the past, over the past four years, 2,500. So we're probably going to be north of that number if you incorporate all of the deployments for the past 13 to 15 years, going back to 2003. So probably closer to 17 years worth of deployments. And, and to echo Bob's point, and here's, here's the, the point of concern for me, and June can certainly um, add her opinion to this. My, my concern is it's important to collect the data for the burn pit registry, which would certainly help with research. But the other part of this is, is we don't know when these aberrant diseases are going to manifest themselves. So our soldiers and airmen could be many years removed from a deployment and have some aberrant form of cancer show up. And if, if they don't know to mention to their primary care provider that they've been exposed, that information, they should be signing a medical release and have that information go back to the VA. So somebody within that process, within their medical system, within their treatment, can establish a potential linkage. Uh, because the stuff that we're seeing uh, is, these are just aberrant diseases that are happening far too early in life. And, and without having folks enrolling and knowing enough to sign a medical release, we're, we're never going to be able to get to this. To, um, I'm looking to, see, to try and find Jessa's. Did you put it on our website, Jill? I'm doing that right now, Madam Chair. I will oh. forward that to everyone. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Well, I, um, Catherine, Catherine. Um, yeah, Madam, Madam Chair, uh, this is Catherine Long. Um, I uh, just want to express appreciation on behalf of the Senator for the work the committee did to um, draw additional attention to this issue na nationwide. I think June is a great example of the kind of advocacy work that is happening um, at the federal level as well as at the state level. So um, just to, to highlight that the, the end result of work like this isn't solely on the number of registrants, but also the broader um, public awareness. Um, I did want to mention that Senator Leahy advocated again for funding um, air Ear, not technically earmarked, but um, dedicated to the center, um, the Airborne Hazards and Burn Pits Center of Excellence um, uh, in the FY20 um, appropriations. And um, we have heard some of that same concern that General Knight mentioned about the firewall. So um, we're very appreciative of the efforts that the National Guard has made to um, circumvent the the DOD issues with that. Um, my sense is that at White River, they're also trying to address any technical issues that individual veterans may be having with the with the registry itself. Um, and I think that that's a good partnership, but perhaps um, the general or Bob would want to comment on that. And then finally, just from my own experience in dealing with veterans, I think um, that piece of educating the medical community is really critical in the National Guard population because so many folks come home and um, you know proceed with their civilian lives and have regular health insurance, regular uh, community providers. So um, to build that awareness is really crucial. I'm um, happy to answer any other questions that may come up, and I'm sure um, Catherine Van Haste has um, some good input as well. Thank you, Catherine. Catherine? Hi, thank you very much for having me here today, Madam Chair. Um, again, this is Catherine Becker Van Haste, State Director for Senator Sanders. Um, so I will just add a little bit to what Catherine Long shared. Um, this has obviously been an issue that Senator Sanders has been closely tracking both from his position as ranking member of the Budget Committee and um, as a member of the Veterans Affairs Committee. 
One of the issues I know we've talked about in the past when I've testified before this committee is the role of the Department of Defense in the initial exposure and responsibility for covering the costs associated with treatment. Um, we all know that regularly um, injuries of body and mind occur while on active duty in the military, and then it is left with the Department of Veterans Affairs to treat um, the conditions that arise after service. Um, so one of the things that Senator Sanders has remained focused on is ensuring that um, the Department of Defense play an appropriate role in responding to the exposures that they caused. Um, to that end, Senator Sanders included requests this year in his um, appropriations uh, requests to um, the Appropriations Committee, of which, of course, uh, Senator Leahy is the vice chair, on both the defense request side and on the military construction and VA side. There is a fund um, that is a joint fund between the DOD and VA. Um, it's, referred, it's called the Healthcare Sharing Incentive Fund, um, which is sort of a matched pot of money between DOD and VA that can assist with funding research. And we had asked, Senator Sanders had asked for an increase in funding to that fund specifically to cover the cost of additional burn pit research, um, because we know that the VA alone um, right now is responsible for all of the research. And we want to ensure that the DOD can help support the cost of that. Um, so he did include that request in this year's um, appropriations process. Um, I did want to let the committee know that we had um, a little bit of success this year, this last year in the National Defense Authorization Act. Um, there were a couple pr provisions included in there um, that had primarily come um, from the House side uh, to address some of the burn pit exposure that happens on the defense side. So um, in that regard, specifically, um, it directed the Department of Defense to track exposure of their service members um, before separation. And if those service members were found to have exposure, which, as um, the Adjutant General spoke to, the vast majority um, of those who have served overseas in the last 15 to 20 years have that exposure, um, that all of those folks be added uh, to the burn pit registry. So that is something that is happening now. Um, for those service members separating uh, looking forward. But of course, it doesn't help those that um, I think this bill so rightly considers, which is some of the folks who have already um, separated from our armed forces, including have had past service in the National Guard. Um, and then the last thing I think I would just mention um, from Bernie's perspective is um, the importance of maintaining a strong VA um, and a VA that has robust uh, ability to serve veterans. Um, he worries significantly about efforts in Congress to privatize the VA and that would sort of uh, dismantle the current uh, VA healthcare system. Um, and in particular, I think this issue highlights the importance of maintaining a strong VA because if all of these veterans from um, every branch of service just go out into the private sector and see their private health, private sector health care provider, those providers are not well equipped and educated to look for these specific issues um, that General Knight spoke to. Um, the VA is certainly um, ahead of the curve there. They're not as ahead as we want them to be. Um, and that's why the research is so important. Um, but they are way better equipped than your average um, private sector general practitioner. Um, they have the research, they have the access to that information. Um, so we want to ensure not only that we maintain a strong and robust VA healthcare system, but also that for every veteran who is eligible for that care, they can get in and get that care uh, when they want it and need it. So I will pause there, but those are some of the issues that um, Senator Sanders has been working on. And again, just thank the committee um, thank Mrs. Heston and Wesley Black and all of the other folks who have really helped bring attention to this issue in Vermont and really had a national impact. So thanks very much. Thank you. Um, um, I am still, I'm concerned about the, the um, I guess it's the DOD um, computers and the access and the, how the firewalls are set up. And I thought 
we had talked about some way of of um, making that easier or allowing the uh, National Guard or the VA to actually register people. Um, do you remember that committee and or the details of that or June, do you remember <coughs> that? Um, we will you repeat that question? Well, I thought that we talked we did talk some before about <coughs> being able to access the computers and right. the, the and and the ability to do that and talked some about making it easier to to access them and to have computers at different places that would allow that to happen. Did anything is that what you meant by setting up um, kiosks? Yes, that's what the, the Guard has done, but that's really relevant for people who are currently in the National Guard. For mm -hmm. veterans who probably don't even know that this is a concern, um, that's where having the health department um, get the information in front of them. So anyone who comes in is asked the question, have you served? and do you think you were exposed? Sometimes they're gonna say no, and the health professionals need to still pursue, um, if they served after 9-11, pursue that, that mm -hmm. line of questioning because they're not necessarily gonna know. The, the registry is, um, is only as good as the information that's put in, and, and that information isn't great right now, and everybody knows that if information isn't great because the veterans, many of the veterans in the last time I, looked at this and Bob can probably um, come up with the more accurate number about 40% of the people who were who began that registry did not finish it. One, it's cumbersome. Two, it asks questions that make you think that they're trying to not be responsible like how many drinks a week do you have? Well that's not relevant to burn pit exposure. Um, it, it is if you're currently in the military and completing that questionnaire, it will ask questions that, that some military members think that it will affect their career. So not everyone is completing. Now, what I've been told is the number is being counted even if the questionnaire hasn't been completed. The other problem is Mike completed it as soon as it came out, but there's no way of knowing in that database that Mike died as a result of his service-connected disability, because you can't go back in and update. So, but but it is the only thing we have right now. And unfortunately, the initial plan on this federal uh, legislation was to sort of come at it as a presumptive issue, so that if you were exposed after 9/11, the presumption was you you are eligible for benefits, but but that is not the direction they're going. So I would love to see our federal delegates get into this conversation early because that eliminates the need for a registry. If, every, if everyone is yeah. exposed, it eliminates that need. And that registry, like the 9-11 registry that was established, it is just not the best data. Yeah, and I, I thought we did talk about that, about um, not only, um, I think um, Catherine talked about um, having the DOD, I think it was Catherine talked about having the DOD track exposure of people who are currently there before separation and then automatically registering them. But I don't know why we can't just automatically register all these 25 or 4,000 people. I, that is I don't, a very good I don't question. get that. Mm -hmm. They say that those systems aren't connected, but if you go in to register in the top right corner, it comes up with your information of where you de were deployed and when, with the exception of special forces. So they, they seem to have the information that they could create this database without putting the onus on the service member or veteran. That is my assumption. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't I don't get that at all. I bet some smart <clears throat> VTC student could figure that out in about 20 minutes. Oh, I see we've been joined by Damien. Allison? So uh, I'm, I'm just looking at Damien's summary. Hi, Damien. 
um, a summary of that. And as I recall, we asked in the bill that the commissioner that we just that we asked the commissioner of health to distribute materials, but we never actually asked or we never required, uh, we, particularly in the civilian population, because sadly, most of the stuff June and everybody, everybody's talking about is really would require federal action to require the VA to ask these questions of the veterans when they go in for their physicals and when they go in for their, their appointments with the doctors. But we could be asking that every, uh, that healthcare providers ask if somebody is a veteran and if they're a veteran, yeah. if they serve in these dates. All we've asked, as far as I can tell on this act, is that we ask to distribute materials, which doesn't actively engage a veteran patient with reviewing their history and looking at possible exposure. Hey, June? You're muted. Oh, there. I think that um, when when that was put in the bill, I was thinking it would be that this information that came from the health department to the medical providers would say, you need to ask the question. Yes. It may not be offered. The reason right. that information is important is because when I was gathering some research for the for um, the the drafting of this other <laughs> legislation, federal legislation. It, it, and Bob, you may have these numbers again. Um, it appears that only about 60% of eligible veterans are actually enrolled in the VA system. And I think less than 40% actually use the VA system. Right. So the majority of the people we're talking about aren't going to the VA. Right. But that's why all the other medical providers, civilian medical providers, need this information in front of them. Uh, I agree, but I am noting that I don't think we actually required them to ask the question. Uh, and so it would be great to have the Department of Health in to see what the materials are that they're distributing now and what are they asking of providers in terms of the questions they're asking patients. And I did send an example of what was being used um, within the, uh, there was some medical information I gathered at um, a TAPS uh, tragedy assistance for, for uh, for program for survivors that I passed along that could be sent to the health department, but I, I haven't seen anything that they've produced. Yeah, so we-, uh, we hi, it, it, Yes. Hi, please. it's Bob. Yep. So June, your, your numbers are, are, you know, within the ballpark in terms of, you know, who is, who is determined eligible and who is using. So, uh, you know, not to make a generic statement, but anybody who serves the minimum amount of active duty is eligible. Okay, where, where and how you get categorized, you know, from um, A to, I think it's G, I think there's nine different levels, you know, that determines whether you, you know, will be able to avail yourself of those services, you know, based on, you know, the, the capacity of the system. You know, I, I'm, I'm not in the VA system. I've never applied because I have civilian insurance and I know that I make too much money and I don't have a VA disability. So there's a lot of people, you know, who are not getting captured. But may, may I just ask, yes. uh, Bob, if yes. you had, I understand you're in the, so to go to this exact point, if you had a condition, it might, well, even though you're not in the VA system, your condition actually may be a result of your exposure as a veteran in something. So, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, you, you actually may have that exact issue. It's, it, which your physician ought to be asking about. Yeah. That's correct. I'm looking at the, um, what Jess has sent. Yes, I, I'm looking at that too. <clears throat> and it really is, it's informational, but it isn't very proactive. Madam Exa Chair? Exactly. Yes, Gail? Uh, Jessa has joined us on the call. She was oh, able to, oh, right. she, Great. She's able to join us. Thank you. 
So Jessa, what this is, is the Department of Health information. Is that what this, what we're looking at? Good afternoon. Thank you. Jessa Barnard with the Vermont Medical Society. Uh, in the bill and in the conversation, we were asked to distribute, uh, well, actually, not just us directly. I think it had initially listed us, but now it's all um, sort of professions and professional mm -hmm. associations through their licensing board. So it's much bigger than the medical society, which only works with physician and physician assistants. Um, so we have been um, doing what we can to share the information from VDH right now. My understanding is that it's the website that we link to in our testimony. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so we have been sharing that um, with our members, you know, we've been covering when the legislature has taken up the issue, we've been putting that in our newsletter. Um, we've been covering it in our legislative updates, and then we've added the information to our website. Um, I don't think we, at this point, to my understanding, we're not asked to specifically um, be asking or, or informing our members about specific screening questions or screening protocols. We'd certainly be happy, you know, if that's something that VDH developed or was working on, we'd certainly be happy to distribute that. I know the licensing boards were also asked to distribute the information to make sure it gets to all licensees, not just members of our association. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're here ready to distribute what, um, or share what information is developed. Well, okay. uh, uh, may yes. I ask a question? Uh, yes, please. I, just, uh, uh, my concern is that uh, as the chair said, as you joined us, this isn't, in a way, it isn't sort of proactive enough because unless you're asking specific patients, you know, in their history, are they, were, did they serve? Are they veterans? And did you have exposure to certain things? I mean, veterans are exposed to all sorts of stuff, not just burn pits and have all sorts of conditions that result from uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome and all, all sorts of other things. I would think that being a veteran would be kind of a key question to ask a patient. And then from that, all sorts of other questions would arise. Um, do you, is there a standard intake form that could, where that question could be added that would be easy to add? I believe that is part of many screening questionnaires, if not for any other reason than that often impacts insurance status. So I do, I do believe that that's often a question that folks are asked when they're registering as a new patient. I could get more information on that. I haven't asked that. Um, you know, that would be great. It would be great to clarify that, to find out what are the standard questions that are asked of patients. Sure. I mean, I'm not, I, I will give the caveat that I think it may be specific to each healthcare provider's office and, um, you know, their patient population and their screen, their, the system they use, but I can see if we can get any information around that. Um, and to the proactive, um, you know, again, that screening piece, since we are not the content experts in this area, the medical society, we were really just following the VDH lead in terms of what information or processes they are recommending. So I will just say, you know, we don't have experts on veterans health or public health on our staff specifically. So we're really the information channel to get to our members rather than the ones to develop that sort of content at this point. Thanks. Sure. So what we really need to do is talk to the Department of Health and about um, both being maybe more proactive in um, getting, asking the questions and then giving the information um, so that, um, yeah. Anything else, committee? That Anthony. You know, this is sort of an aside, but it reminds me that we had a conversation yesterday, well, the other day, about a bill that we were going to look at, which asked the Agency of Human Services, I think, to ask about veteran status on application for certain programs. Mm -hmm. And that would be one way to like move this, you know, maybe sign some other people up, identify veterans who might be eligible. We had, talked about not, we had talked about not moving the bill, but maybe this is a reason to move it. Well, we talked about doing it kind of, Brian. Right, writing a letter or something. Right. So I just wanted to add on to Senator uh, Polina's uh, 
testimony there. And, and it did, we did, or indeed, we did talk about not necessarily making it a bill, but sometimes things are more effective when you just send a letter because you can direct it exactly the way you want. Whereas in a bill, you, you face, of course, getting it passed by both bodies and, and moving it along. So I still would maybe favor that because I think we can put in that letter specific requests. But my question now, I guess, is in terms of this committee for our guests, what sort of legislation would be particularly helpful going forward? In other words, we did what we did last year. It seems to have worked fairly well for the most part, but are there specific things that this committee could do not necessarily this session, but next session going forward that would even make things better. <laughs> Madam Chair, yes. Um, this is Catherine Long with Senator Leahy's office. Um, I just wanted to speak to the point around um, uh, asking that question, and, and Bob may have some better insights into the history of that. That's been, you know, a topic of conversation, you know, for the 12 years I've been in my position here. Um, but one of the things that is available to the state of Vermont, um, if uh, in coordination with the VA, is what's called the Paris Match, which would allow you to uh, filter your um, beneficiaries against. Um, against the VA list. Um, and that's been used in some states to very good effect to try to offer um, dual folks who are eligible for VA services and also receiving uh, state benefits, um, you know, that additional federal support. Um, that's something that Becky Rhodes at the White River Junction VA Medical Center is um, interested in making happen. And I'd be happy to talk with folks more about that. Um, but it seems to me that that might be a way of at least engaging some of the population that's on state um, health insurance. So I just, I have a question and I think all of these, we can think about doing all of these, but what is the impediment and do we have any ability to automatically register this whatever it is, 3,000, 4,000 people. We know, we know where they served. There's, they're eligible to be on the registry. Why, we, we automatically register people to vote when they fill in their, when they renew their driver's license. <clears throat> why, why is it such an impediment for us to, or what is the impediment for us to automatically register these 4,000 people or whatever those people are? We know that there's those five theaters. They served there during a period right. of time. Just register them. Can, can somebody help me understand why we can't do that? I don't know, Bob. Yeah, so this is, this is Bob Burke. Um, so it's it's the proverbial, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Um, so you, you can't register anybody without having them answer the questions. Um, I can't provide benefits to every, anybody if they don't call me and and ask for help. I mean, we, we do it the opposite way. We, we outreach to people and say, do you need help? Do you know about these benefits? Uh, and some of them will say, yeah, I do, but I'm, I'm all set, or I've tried and I've gotten turned down so many times. I want nothing to do with the VA. So it's, um, it's hard, uh, you know, of the, you know, thousands of veterans that we have in Vermont, we, we have a very low usage of federal or state benefits. But this is more than just, this is more than just for benefits. This is for um, tracking the potential for diseases and also for doing the, the research to, if, if I remember right, doing the research to figure out which are the presumptive illnesses that are going to be covered here. So uh, they're not necessarily, even if they register, they're not necessarily gonna get any additional benefits. So I, I guess I don't 
understand um, and if we <coughs> have to ask the questions about how many drinks do you have in a week, let's make it up. I have five drinks every week. I mean, if, if they're irrelevant questions, um, June? Senator White, the, the problem isn't gonna be solved by the Vermont staff in the Veterans Affairs Office because this, right. is, this is a federal issue. And I, and I think those questions, somebody else came up with them. 80% of them are on their annual um, health review. And so why it's even on there, I'm not sure, but we, we aren't gonna fix that. The the, our federal government needs to fix that. I think our issue is visibility and letting people know that okay. this is a big concern. And so one of the things that kind of fell to the wayside was I was working with WCAX on uh, PSA. They really wanted to be connected with a nonprofit so <laughs> them with TAPS in DC because it's, it's a national nonprofit. It would be great to get them involved. And, and the ball was dropped on the nonprofit side. I'm willing to start that conversation with WCAX because one of the things in the new proposed legislation is the, the increased risk with those veterans and, and current service members be, having exposure because of COVID-19. Oh. Brings another level of risk to our, our military members and our veterans. So I think now is a great opportunity to sort of put that urgency message out there. Is there another nonprofit, if they still wanna be associated with a nonprofit, is there a local nonprofit that could affiliate with them? I actually think it should be national. And I think so that this message gets out broader yeah. than Vermont, but if we're not successful in doing that, I mean, what I hadn't thought of before is going to this, um, this group of, nonprofits that are working on this legislation. Uh, Wounded Warriors, Warriors is one of them, the Hunter 7 Foundation, which is doing a ton of research. They have actual science behind exposure and illness. And so um, I think what I'll do is approach one of them to say, would you be willing to be the nonprofit that gets this awareness out? Hunter 7 would be my first choice because they are doing unbelievable work in connecting exposure to illness. That sounds great. I will take that. <clears throat> so Madam Chair, this is General Knight. Yes, please go ahead. So one other thing that we've, I've noted, at least from our most recent deployment experience with our aviation unit, our medevac company, uh, before they left theater, uh, they were sat down in front of a computer kiosk and the soldiers that were on that deployment registered. So that helps us getting at it at the front end. Um, we still have a long way to go. And, and thank you, June, for, for taking it up, but getting the word out and, and addressing those that have been deployed and who have not yet registered. I think the numbers, if you look, you know, 20 years of, of deployments across the nation, you know, we're probably over a million service members with one or more deployments. And the data that I've got in front of me um, through 31 March of 2020 only shows 200,104 veterans uh, completed the questionnaire uh, since June of 2014. So there's a, a heck of a lot of work to do. So at one point we had talked about, um, <clears throat> and I must admit that I kind of dropped the ball on this one, but we had talked about having days in different counties where people could, we would do <clears throat> promote and have people come and uh, sign up. And is that still something that can happen? Would that be helpful? Is there, I know it's probably harder now because of COVID-19, but um, I, I don't know if we could have a, a virtual <laughs> registration. I, I don't know, but is there something that we can do to spread it across the state. Anybody have any suggestions about that? I admit yeah. that I was going to be working yeah. with Laura, uh, Laura Sibelia, and we just got so wrapped up in other things that it never did really happen, but would be willing to try again. Well, Senator, this is General Knight. That's actually a really good idea. Um, so one of the kiosks that, that Mr. Gregg had um, 
set up. They're not just, they don't just reside, they're not within a hard structure. We have a mobile kiosk, so we could certainly work to put that kiosk on the road and move it around the state and publicize that accordingly and see if we get any returns on that. Okay, Brian. Thank you, Madam Chair. So to sort of connect perhaps uh, your suggestion and General Knight and June's, um, we speak quite often with Wendy Mays, who is the uh, head of the Vermont Association of Broadcasters. So not just Channel 3, but Channel 5 and then all the radio stations, if we could get a sort of coordinated public service announcement that you could voice June going forward and then tagging it with specific locations where people could go to register and coordinating that with General Knight's mobile unit, I think, I think we could make a pretty good dent in that overall number. I agree. And then we could follow it up with the mobile unit going around to each county or, or right. whatever, whatever we, we could do a, a, you know, an all state tour of it. <clears throat> right, that's what I meant. Yep. Yeah, I think that was what Brian. That's great. Yeah. And I'd be willing to talk to uh, Wendy about it. Good. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Yeah, that's a great thought. So if we were to um, think about doing something with this mobile kiosk um, and getting it around the state, if we started, if we could get, um, I don't know exactly how we would do it in different parts of the state. I can tell you the um, Wyndham County delegation, which is a nonpartisan group. It's just all the uh, legislators from Wyndham County. We meet regularly, and my guess is that we would be, we could sponsor something like this, the the, del, the whole delegation, that we could figure out a couple different places in Wyndham County, <coughs> like one on the east side and one on the west side to, to um, have it and get some dates and, and figure out how to do it. So I don't know how, it might be different in different counties about how how it would be organized, but is that something we could start to think about? Absolutely. Rutland County would be glad to uh, be part of that. I could speak to the delegation. I think. Yeah, we, and we could pull the Windsor County caucus together and do the same thing. I mean, I think it would be a great way to actually get the county caucuses together and host it. Mm -hmm. and, and it is something that we can do that truly, truly, truly is nonpartisan. It is, <clears throat> um, so we have almost a fifth of the counties represented on our committee, so. I mean a third, I mean a third. <coughs> My math skills are gone today. It may have some general night. Hey, excuse me? This is General Knight. So the only thing we would need is, is Wi-Fi access. So a number of ways to approach it as we move it around the state. Um, my initial thinking is, is we could even leverage our, our veterans organizations and our, our patriotic organizations like the VFW and the American Legion. I'm sure they'd be more than happy to, to facilitate and they would give us enough space in there to be able to set it up and, and maintain, you know, social distancing and all that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Yeah, that's a great idea. All right, committee, are we, um, I'm up for the challenge. Brian, you're up for the challenge. Yep. Allison. Yeah, and we have the VA, so we it's a natural thing for us to do it in the VA and then maybe a couple locations. I mean, maybe we could do it in a couple locations in each county, because it, my, that's the statistics about the number of Vermont veterans who access their vet, their benefits is really discouraging, Bob. I think that's odd that they, you know, you said that many don't take advantage of their VA benefits. That's correct. Yeah, that's that we could be boosting that at the same time. And Senator Clarkson, that that's a that's a national number but ah. I'm guessing it is reflective in Vermont. 
<clears throat> okay, so what I'm going to suggest is that we think about this, that we do a couple things, that we find out from the Department of Health um, their, what, what they're doing and, and suggest to them that they might be more proactive in, their, um, in what they're sending out to people, what they're giving people, and find out if there is a way to make sure that people are <clears throat> that their patients are questioned about um, whether they're a veteran and if they served in in those theaters in those dates. And then, so that's one thing. And um, <clears throat> then we can kind of do some thinking about um, how we might organize some kind of a sign up day or whatever we want to call it and do some more um, publicity on that. And then Brian, you're going to <clears throat> look at talking to Wendy and work with June and Wendy on some kind of a PSA. Brian. Thank you, Madam Chair. June, did you ever re actually record one or was that still in sort of the exploratory phase? It what we had not recorded. We had scripted um, with Jay, um, at who's the GM at WCAX, and he yeah. ready to go. But he he was then working with Taps. The person there was left the organization, so it we really haven't gotten very far. But I will follow up with Jay. And can you remind me of what M Wendy's last name is? Mays, M A Y S. Okay, I'll let him know that you'll be reaching out to her. Yes, and there actually is a file then, an audio file and, and obviously a video one too. It's a written script. That's, okay. that's okay. it. Mm -hmm. Yep. We'll pull it together. Great. <clears throat> Anything else where, that would be helpful for how about from the federal delegation's perspective? Anything that would be helpful for us to, to do? Uh, I, this is Catherine Van Hayes. So I would say from my perspective, this is great. Um, I would, I think, put it a bit back on you and say if there's anything you want us to be doing um, on behalf of Vermonters, certainly we hear you on the cumbersome nature of um, the registry. Um, mm -hmm. We're happy to take that back to our members um, and to the committees that look at that issue. Um, but we really appreciate your focus on this. And uh, if there's anything we do that I do think of that might be helpful, um, we'll certainly let you know. But really appreciate the idea of thinking about how to um, get out and about and communicate to Vermonters about enrolling in the VA generally and in this registry. That's something that Bernie works on a lot and it's great to have your partnership on. Good, thank you. Catherine? Yeah, I would um, echo that. Uh from uh, Catherine that um, we're happy to help in whatever way we can we appreciate what you're doing. Um, and if you need help uh, making that connection with the VA, of course, um, we're always happy to help with that. So thank is you. It, is it helpful or not helpful to have you both named Catherine? <laughs> <laughs> it's a little confusing. <laughs> Dep depends on the day. The fact that yeah. we spell it differently is also either better or worse, depending That's on the. That's true. <laughs> yeah. so. Allison, uh, I'm just curious. In following up with June and the and the federal legislation, who's who's sponsoring that in both bodies, and how could we be helpful as a committee, sending a letter uh, to uh, those uh sponsors or to those committees saying how much we support this work or you know whatever how could we be helpful supporting at a federal level um that's a good question and i, I what i'll do is try to find out if they want help it's a it seems a bit um uh they have a very tight-knit group and so right now i know that senator gillibrand has legislation that's being propo proposed that I believe has presumptive language in it. This team group, um, the, the group that's working on the VA legislation is, and has a group of um, nonprofits working, they, they also have Senator Ruiz working with them who has been active. 
I would like to find out, and then there's separate legislation that's been proposed by two other senators. So let me get all of the details on that and, and get that back to you. Facts. Right. <clears throat> and anything else committee that we um, have neglected or thought about? Um, Chris, I will try. Chris has a question. Oh, there you are, Chris Bray. Thank you. Right there in the Senate chamber. Yes, waiting for um, The uh, question I, so I just wanted to double back. I mean, I think it's a great idea, the outreach work, and I'm just trying to have a sense of like the, the project manager view of this, like what pieces get assembled when, and is there someone, I mean, I know there's a, a PSA under development, is there sort of a flyer version of that? It's something that we can send to local papers. And, you know, uh, and then I'm thinking about timing. Uh, Addison County and Rutland County are right next to each other. You know, do they spend a full day someplace or do they spend the morning in Addison and go on down to Rutland and things like that? Um, so I don't know. I just didn't know if someone has, is thinking about how to make the whole thing hang together and who that is. It needs to be this committee or what? <clears throat> you know, I don't know. I threw the question out and and I'm perfectly happy to take it on for Wyndham County and do the logistics around that and working with um, General Knight around dates and getting it out and stuff like that. Um, in terms of statewide, I don't know that we have anybody that <clears throat> we would ask to, that would be pretty major um, project. And I, and I didn't mean to imply that it should be the legislative delegation in every area. There might be a very appropriate nonprofit or a community group or particular um, organization or person who in a county that would be more appropriate. Sure. I just suggested our delegation because our delegation tends to be very active in <clears throat> that kind of stuff. And Laura Sibelia and I were two of the kind of promoters of it. Well, I think Chris's point is a good one. It needs to be organized by someone. It would be sort of crazy to get the kiosk down to Wyndham County for a day and then not be able to work it it needs a strategy and a sort of a, a tour director. And uh, I think we could all plug in, but it's going to be a busy, weird summer. And uh, as, as well, as much as, I mean, maybe, uh, Greg, you had somebody that might be interested in doing that and coordinating <coughs> with all of us. But I, I, I do think it needs somebody to be in charge of it. Yes, ma'am. I, I think it's actually a, a pretty straightforward approach. Um, Last my volunteer for something. I've been doing it for 37 years, so this will be an easy one. <laughs> well, so we, we can we can do the so to, to Senator Bray's point, um, we have a flyer. We can easily modify it to, to be inclusive of dates and locations, and push that out to all the respective delegations throughout the state with an according schedule, and then uh, perhaps leverage uh, Wendy Mays to help publicize that, and then certainly the National Guard. Air Guard, Army Guard, and my uh, social media pages, and and then do that with the town clerks and Department of Health. Plenty of ways to get it out there. Just takes a little bit of coordination. Brian. Yeah, I would only offer that it's your deli wagon, General. So we would be at your mercy to kind of figure out the schedule of if it makes more sense to start all the way in the south and then work up or the other way down. Um, I think that would be something that. We could take direction from you if you're willing to, or your volunteer are willing to do that. We got it, sir. We have that as a do out. We'll come up with a plan and we'll push that out to the committee. Great. Right. We'd That's love to great. hear about it. <clears throat> June. Madam Chair, my only concern is with COVID-19, is this effective now? Because there's so much conversation about social distancing it, is this going to be perceived as not doing what we're told to do? 
Well, I think that um, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about this being later. I mean, not not right now, but maybe. And we're from everything we hear or that I hear, we're expecting some kind of a resurgence late in the fall. So I was thinking like September um, when maybe we don't see the resurgence yet, but we might see some uh, relief from the current one. That, that was what I was thinking. And, and I think that um, it actually could um, be helpful because of the, um, I don't remember who it was that mentioned that, oh, it was you, I believe, that mentioned that now with COVID-19, it's even a more, there's even more exposure issues. Yeah. So, um, or vulnerabilities. So it might be good to be able to say, you know, kind of in the lull here, let's, let's take care of this. Let's get these people registered. That, that was what I was thinking. I wasn't thinking of now because yes, I think okay, it'll take you. a while. Yes. And I think with the COVID-19 message, making it more <clears throat> is a plus. Allison. Well, we, I agree, June, it now may not be the exact moment, but once the, maybe the emergency orders are, have, have changed and shifted a bit, we could take advantage of that, but it may all be, maybe it is more appropriately a, another uh, uh, public service message that's out there and that somehow we can reinforce in some way, but I'm, I'm open to all of it. Uh, but I think you're right. It has to wait. The, the, the tour would probably have to wait. Uh, but we could also do a virtual tour. I mean, there are lots of ways we could do it. So it's, it's just good to put our thinking caps on and start thinking about how we might do it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> In the meantime, then, um, by the time we get to that, so we could have some dates and stuff, the um, PSAs could be being right. done and worked on so that we would have those available to, to use. <clears throat> Damien, did you want to weigh in at all? I see you've been with us and we appreciate that. No, I'm just here listening in. Um, so I don't have anything to add. Thank you for being here. Thank you. <clears throat> anything else that you can think of committee or anybody else? So I will write something up um, with to the Department of Health. Um, and also, I think that what I would like to do is then do a, um, I'll get a list from the Department of Health and from OPR of all the professional medical professional organizations. Like Jessa said, it isn't just the Vermont Medical Society. It's the <coughs> Society of um, Advanced Nurse Practitioners. And there's a whole bunch of them and see what if they have been act proactive doing anything and and find out from them so i will take that on to get that to find out from them if they're doing anything because i have nothing else to do <laughs> hi madam chair this is bob burke hi bob hi so i i just i want to thank everybody for for re-engaging and reinvigorate, reinvigorating. Um, it can sometimes feel like a small voice crying out in the night, um, but I think this is a, a very relevant and very pertinent topic um, to keep pressure on. Thank you, thank you. And <clears throat> it would be great when we get the, um, uh, when there's some kind of a PSA and as part of that, uh, we can all have some talking points because we all write articles for our papers and we all write on front porch forum and those kinds of things. So <clears throat> I think that um, we can use those talking points in those, um, the things that we write. Anything else? Also. Okay, so if anybody thinks of anything, um, 
let me know it's only a little after two o'clock. Are we done? This is stunning. Well, the day began at seven, so right. I feel like I put in a full day's work. You what? I feel as though I put in a full day's work. I started at seven this morning. I know, I know. Yes. Wow. <clears throat> so um, for those who are, who considered running and actually turned in their names, uh, somebody said to me that they were surprised that there weren't more people <clears throat> turning in their names to run this year because they didn't have to um, get petitions signed. And so it was easier. And I said, anybody who's watching us in committees or in the all Senate meetings or in the floor meetings and sees how much older and tireder and bedraggled we look, why would they want to? I mean, why would they want to join us? Yes. I don't know. Why would, they, uh, why would they want to put themselves through this? We have people who can't have haircuts. We have people who are shut up in little dark rooms. So, and then we have Chris well, Bray, who's at the State House. Yeah. No, he's not really. Holding well, down the court. Um, <laughs> outside, the Jill, outside the house clerk's office, there's uh, a bunch of big, beautiful panoramic photos of the house members. They did them a number of years, a long time ago. And when I first got here, I looked at that and I said, who are all these young people that I, I know they're still here in the house? And, and it, said, it must be like a 10 year old photo. And then I looked and it's like, wait, this photo is only four years old. What happened to them in four years? And then I realized that room, this building's like an accelerated aging chamber or something. Uh -huh. Things to uh, uh, host people. Oh. Allison? Well, I was just going to say, you know, maybe they actually talked to people and found out that the, the petitions is the easy part of campaigning. Campaigning is hard work. <laughs> and that maybe they found out actually that it's it's tough to run. It's, uh, it's, it's a full time and it's not easy. So anyway, June, we welcome you to campaign season. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm drinking from a fire hose. <laughs> yes, I uh -huh. you are. <laughs> Uh, and it's the most unusual campaign season most of us have ever faced. So it's right. going to be a very interesting. It is. It is. All right. So um, anything else, committee? If well, not, I had a question. I, I didn't oh, get yes, Chris? just when we were starting. So I don't know if prior to going on the air, you had a conversation at all about floor today. But I, uh, I thought we, maybe. We did not. OK. Um, <clears throat> we could have a conversation about it if you would like. And we also um, brought, remember, we brought back 558, but we're dealing with that tomorrow. So, well, no, I just had a point of information. A question came up about the sort of um, egregious behavior down in the Carolinas where someone was sort of out harvesting ballots, you know, and right, and maybe somewhat coercively, I think was the sense that was of concern. And since I'd already spoken, I didn't want to speak again, but there, there is a provision in that chapter I quoted from Offenses Against the Purity of Elections. I love that title. <laughs> and um, sorry, I'm trying to, yeah, it's, it's the 14th of 16 provisions. This number 2017. It's an undue influence provision. It says a person who attempts by bribery, threats, or any undue influence to dictate, control, or alter the vote of a voter about to be given at a local primary, general, or general election shall be fined. You know, not more than two hundred bucks. So we've made it a crime to try to influence. Now, how? Of course, there's a certain amount of influence, and it goes on with people walk door to door and stuff like that. But so what What shifts something over to the world of undue influence? I don't know legally, but um, there is a provision that <coughs> attempts at least to address that uh, kind of coercive uh, outreach work. I, I can, I will um, give you a response I had back from the Secretary of State's office, but before I 
do that just because we've kind of shifted topics here. <clears throat> I'm going to um, welcome people to stay if they would like, but Bye. knowing that you probably all have busy schedules, um, we thank you very much for coming and, but you are most welcome to stay to talk about our all the other issues. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you. Bye. 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 -bye. So, thank you. <clears throat> um, I did have an well, answer. Well, they left from... in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> I did have an answer from the Secretary of State about that. And they are um, working on, I mean, they can make some, let me pull it up here. Um, uh, should, should, while there, you're looking that up, Jeanette, should we ask yes. uh, if, if Betsy Ann could join us? Okay. Um, I don't, I don't, she can, if she wants to, if she's available. Okay. Gail, could we ask Betsy? Cause I think the question of undue influence and whether it's defined or what it is, what the fine line is, would be interesting. Yeah, well, I'll actually and, have another meeting at two 30. Um, let me just throw this out quickly then because Brian, yeah, this I, I was the also. person that asked the question. Right. So <clears throat> what the secretary of state's office sent back is that they are working with the town clerks on how how to um, do that, how, how to um, make, <clears throat> avoid that kind of egregious behavior that happened in North Carolina, which I don't know that we should assume will happen here, but, but not make it so, uh, restrictive that it somehow disenfranchises people who actually need to have somebody come and get their ballots for them. So <clears throat> um, if you limited it to family members, you may have somebody who really doesn't have a family member that exactly. can do that for them. If you limited it to um, BCA members, <coughs> that, that, um, really puts them at kind of the beck and call because that could happen anytime. The, when BCA members go out, it's usually to actually have somebody vote. And it is almost always on election day. That's the way they do it. So they're trying to figure out how to do that in a way that um, isn't so restrictive that it disenfranchises, disenfranchises people who actually need need people to help them get their ballots in. But they are working on that. All right, if Senator Polina came over and said, uh, I'm going to the town clerks, why don't we take your ballot? I, I would feel fine about handing it over. If he said, hey, let's go over that ballot together, <laughs> then that would be pretty different. You know, like, what are you thinking about for a select board or whatever, you know, so uh, it's very different ways of helping. There are, and you have to be really careful, like people <clears throat> um, who live in assisted living facilities often need help, ha even help ha filling out the ballot sure. for them. You can ask, uh, who do you want to vote for, for governor, without saying, uh, you'd really like to vote for this person for governor, wouldn't you? It, it's a um, little bit nuanced. But um, <clears throat> I, I think we need to be really careful that we don't that we don't disadvantage people who actually need help. Well, thank heavens in a way that we've been running the experiment of thirty percent of Vermonters or whatever already voting uh, via absentee or early ballots. Mm -hmm. so it, this is, you know, I, I would like to think it won't be substantially different than our current experience um, and, and <laughs> so currently somebody could do that currently right. senator polina could come over to you and say hey let's go you want me to help you with this ballot right and then i'll take it and deliver it for you or um did you happen to vote in this way well i'll take your ballot and i'll just put it in the trash can i mean currently that could happen i don't know that it'll happen more <clears throat> i um, keep an eye on him as he leaves that's what i do generally 
but okay. <clears throat> and anyway, so I had, I, I had seen that provision and I had wanted to share it in committee, not on the floor because uh, I'd already shared sort of a longish answer on something else, so. It was, that, no, I thought you were, I thought it was very helpful what you did. <coughs> and so, well, it just <coughs> do you it, want? We were, we were worrying so much about the ballots. Uh, Senator Benning was calling them live ballots. So they, in a way, like, well, okay, so they could take on a life of their own, but somebody has to pick them up and vote them and return them in some way or another. And, and that person is bound by all the current law. So as I read that chapter, I said, you know, we've, we've actually worked very carefully to craft 16 provisions all aimed at trying to make sure that um, these, the ballots are protected, you know, appropriately protected, so. So <clears throat> I don't know if you want to, uh, there was one other question that um, I did not have an answer for that came from Senator Benning about <clears throat> the list and whether it would be available from the vendor but the vendor actually gets the list from the town clerks. That's where the list comes from. And anybody can get <clears throat> the list from the town clerks. And it can be used for any purposes except commercial purposes. So um, right now, I don't know um, how campaigns do it, but many campaigns check every day to see who has been mailed an absentee ballot. And then you call them and make sure that they send their absentee ballot in and you check them off and <clears throat> campaigns do that all the time right now. It will be no different um, if it, just because they're mailed out of a central place. And the mailing lists are, the, well, you know, the voter checklists are available for anybody. Yeah, Chris. Chris? Well, Having worked with um, mailing lists and stuff, they they can be so messy, um, and you know someone's entered the data wrong and things are missing and blah blah blah. Uh, it would be a a scrubbed list that is the work product of the vendor who's putting <coughs> the mailing together. For instance, they check against they check addresses against that um, post office database and make sure it's a quote unquote valid address. Mm -hmm. A scrubbed list would be far more valuable than just the raw list from your town clerk. A vendor doesn't isn't going to do that. That's going to be the secretary of state and the town clerk that do that before they give it to the vendor. Okay. Well, that's sometimes that's a vendor service. They take your mailing list, no matter how good you think it is, and they validate it for you. Try yeah, I think that's true. And it's a worthwhile service because they're usually really good at it. And the rest of us are plugging away, doing many things. So um, at any rate, so I think there is an interesting question there. Like, can now does the vendor who's created this quote unquote scrubbed list, um, do they have to release that upon request of anyone else? I, I, I don't know. No idea. I think it says the government agency has to release it. But I'll, I, I have the Secretary of State checking on that. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Anything else, committee? No. What's that? Well, actually, okay. you know, the, Janet, that bill yeah. we passed over this morning, I forget yeah, the what number, was but that? we passed over a bill. It was <laughs> our bill that where we talked about the notices, like posting notices. And I, what they added to it, it was um, the idea of moving borrowing from a town road fund to use for general expenses and or borrowing oh. from a general fund to use for road expenses, that thing. So I don't think we would, we're not opposed to that idea, but I think it made sense. <clears throat> we should at least look at it and decide if you want to think about it anymore. Yeah, and I, I was, I forgot about that. We should have done that this afternoon so we could do it tomorrow. It just um, allows them to mix their fund, their highway funds with their other funds, right? It, yeah, basically uses the word borrow that you could borrow from the general fund to put into the road fund and you, you could borrow from the road fund to put into the general fund. I use the word borrow. 
But basically, yes, that's what it does. Boy, I, that isn't the bill that I looked at. The one I looked at, it added, we took the legislative body of a municipality and let them only post the physical location. Remember, we changed all that. Yeah. And I thought this added things like um, the de de development review board and all that other stuff. But maybe I was looking at the wrong bill. What is the number, Anthony? I don't know. I'm looking. I forget. I think it was S-345. Does that sound right? That sounds right. Yeah. Well, I, we have it in the calendar right here, so we can just look. Well, I don't have the calendar up anymore. And I can pull it up quickly. <clears throat> um, It was 345, yep, three, it, good memory. Uh, an act relating to temporary municipal meeting provisions in response to COVID outbreak. So what I've opened it up on? and it says- It's on page 49, sorry, 4914, page 4914. It says during a declared state of emergency, a municipal public body may post any meeting agenda or notice of a special meeting in two designated electronic locations in lieu of the two designated public places in the municipality or in any combination of those, a municipal public body shall post the notice or agenda in or near the municipal office, clerk's office, and will provide a copy of each notice or agenda to the newspapers. I think but, didn't we, we did that for everything else except for like the BCA and the De Development Review Board and that kind of thing, no? But when I go to page 4914, I look at House Proposal of Amendment for S345, <coughs> it says municipal property tax, highway expenditures, general government expenditures, oh. notwithstanding, et cetera, um, a municipality is authorized to one, borrow monies appropriated from property taxes for the highway expenses of the municipality as part of the budget approved by the legal, state, legal voters of the municipality to expend on general government expenses. So basically you could borrow from the, borrow oh. monies appropriated from property taxes for the highway <laughs> fund to go into general government. And then number two is borrow money appropriated from property taxes for the general government fund of municipality <clears throat> as part of the budget to expend on highway construction, highway expenditures. It's a strike, it's a strike all. No, they struck section two, and I don't remember what section two I was. I think section two was just the effective date. Yeah, and then they added this. It's not a strike all. It, it strikes out section two, and then oh, adds I this. Forget. Right. <clears throat> and now section three is the effective date. And all this does is currently state law says that they cannot use highway funds <clears throat> for anything other than highway funds. That's, but the highway funds and the the general fund of the municipality are not fungible. They, and all this is saying is let us move them back and forth. And this does not apply to, um, <clears throat> it only applies to municipal funds. It doesn't apply to state highway funds that come to the municipalities, right? It okay. says it only property taxes collected by the, by the municipality. This section shall not apply to any state aid for town highways. Right. It's just saying that if, if they're unable, I mean, it's, it's another instance in my mind of us being so over prescriptive for the towns that they have to come to us to say, <clears throat> we can't do our highway project this summer. Or we're way behind because of the emergency order. Can we use this money for something else that's really necessary in our town? Brian? Okay, and I agree with all that. I just don't remember voting it out. How did it get to the floor if it's got a proposal of amendment on it? We voted this out. This we is did. <clears throat> this is now them sending it back to us. This is, this is the House of, of proposal of amendment. Back. <clears throat> S-345 was about the... Anthony, I believe you are right, and Brian, you are right. S-345 was allowing the municipalities to not have to um, post their uh, 
agendas in certain places. Right. It went to the House. They are adding this to that bill. They're not changing the bill that we had. They're just adding this because they needed a vehicle right. <clears throat> for this issue. It would be nice to see the bill actually in entirety so that we, we actually see that our work is still intact. So that section one is was our work. Is that what you're yes. saying? Yes. So let's look at S345. It also, by the way, says that if you borrow money from fund to fund, the municipality that borrows and extends monies under this section shall no later than December 31st, 2021, transfer to any such fund from which such borrowing has been made in an amount equal to such borrowed amount together with interest. So basically you have to pay it back as well to the which fund fixed amount. <clears throat> which doesn't make any sense to me at all. They ought to be able yeah. to do what they want you know, with their own their money, money. But I agree. But that's not the way we operate. So it says with interest on the borrowing amount at such rate as those say body. So, so the town is paying itself interest. Right. It makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. The opposite of a state bank. <laughs> it is a strike off. It says strike section two. Well, I'm looking at the calendar from last week. Where the heck did I put it now? This is getting very complicated. If you pull the bill up, and yeah. it shows you the history of the bill. On 529, whatever, I, I guess that was Friday, it, that was it Friday. refers to the calendar page 4816. Okay. And when I open <coughs> that up, it says the House proposes to the Senate to amend the bill by stri oh, striking out section two. You're right. Yeah. In its entirety and inserting in lieu. Okay. So, and if you look, if you look at the bill, S-345, as passed by the Senate, right. <clears throat> section one is the temporary authority to do electronic posting. Section two is the effective date. So all they've done is strike the effective date, added their section two, and section three is now the effective date. Right, okay. <clears throat> and I'm <clears throat> I'm fine with it. I don't see any need to have to pay it back, but for some reason, maybe the league wanted to do that so that they didn't have select boards willy-nilly switching, switching funds around. Boy, that must have been in uh, La La Land because I don't remember voting on this section. We didn't. We didn't. This is all oh. new. This Phew. is their proposal of amendment to okay. us. <clears throat> and it came to the floor today because when they send it back with a proposed amendment, it just comes to us and we can concur or ah, not. Okay. <clears throat> so my suggestion is that tomorrow we simply concur. So it, it does say, Anthony, when we were talking about the interest, it does say that the interest at, at such a rate as the legislative body of the municipality shall determine. So okay. it could conceivably say 0% interest. In, yeah, that, would, that would make sense, wouldn't it? <clears throat> it, it makes, even, even if they said 25% interest, they're paying interest from one to another. I, they're paying themselves interest. So what difference I, does it make? I know. I don't know even it's, why. But anyway, yeah. I, so so could, do we, could, can we concur with this tomorrow? Sure. Brian? Yeah, I'm fine with it. Chris? Yes, ma'am. That's the thumbs up symbol. Oh, yeah. Allison? Yeah. I, I, yes, I, I'd love to just check in uh, as we get through to more. Uh, where's our bill about our. Um, uh, no, wait, let's about, finish this one first. Okay. Let's finish this one first. Yeah, I'm fine with this. Okay, now. Now, what's your question? My question is, where is our bill about um, the special voting and the village voting? Is it gone to the governor? Is it? I, I just couldn't remember where where it was the about, about the villages and the, 
and the uh, you know the, the places that haven't yet voted. Oh, the school stuff, you mean? No, 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 no not the school. No, the town. The very town, town Woodstock Village one. It's um, the it. I I can't remember where it is. Is it in the house or did it go to the? Did we finish it? I don't remember we, the number. We, we voted it out. Uh -huh. We voted we it out on the Senate it. floor. Right, I know we did, but I can't remember if that was it or if it went back to the house. Do you remember, Do you remember the, the bill number? number? No. But let's look at bills in and out of committee, and I should do that. <clears throat> it seems like it was an H bill, so it's probably in the governor's hands. Well, yeah, but has he signed it? I mean, anyway, I'm just right. I have no idea. <clears throat> I don't know what the number was, but we can check on it and see. OK. Uh, we, I haven't, we haven't heard anything from any of those towns, so. Um. Okay, are we all set? Yep. I think we are. All right, I'm going to go work in my garden in the cold weather. It is cold, but it's, at least it's not zero degrees. <laughs> Well, I was walking the dogs last night and I said, wait, it's June. I have <laughs> long pants, <laughs> socks, boots. I have a uh, polar fleece on, my wool jacket on top of that. A oh, hat, no. A hat, wool hat, and uh, gloves. And, and we were fast walking, so it wasn't like you're we dawdling. And it was still a little chilly out there. Well, it was kind of damp here. Yeah. <laughs> Well, this is what happens when you live this close to the North Pole. It just is <laughs> cold. Well, it can only get better. Anybody else? Have fun. Enjoy. Fun. And we'll see thank you tomorrow. Thanks. Peter Bye. Bye. Bye.